we're here to stretch your thinking and get you uh, delving into maybe areas of life and subjects that maybe you don't really have time to do on a normal basis. We are the People's Countryside Environmental Debate Podcast, and the subject today is the right to roam, um, getting a, a finished perspective on the British situation uh, about trespass laws and, uh, and different cultural views on the, um, the wilderness. Uh, what is wilderness to us? I'm Stuart the Wild Man Mabber, and my job is getting people out into nature in as many ways as possible. But the biggest challenge I've got doing that at the moment is coming out of COVID. I, I, I'm suffering like a lot of people with social anxiety. So I, I actually don't want to go outside my front door to get people out into nature. But anyway, that's my challenge for the week. And my co-host is uh, William Manclo. Yes, thanks very much for being with us. I will point out at this point, this is being entirely recorded. This is unusual for us. It's entirely recorded over Zoom uh, because the guest we have with us today is, I think, about 3,000 miles away from us, Stuart. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to point that out to you. So the quality of the recording might be a little bit different. Yeah, this is the Environmental Debate Podcast. Uh, we, we discuss so many different things on, on this podcast. The listener questions that come in. Uh, cover such a wide variety of topics you know it can be a very meandering conversation quite often and I'm sure this will be no be no different but mm. you think it's a hot potato don't you Stuart right well it is for me <laughs> uh the uh we're not scientists we're just uh two guys two people just like you trying to wade through the big issues and we're gonna roam through this conversation with our guest who was our guest William it's Helly uh, we've known each other for a number of years. You went to university with my wife, didn't you, Helly? I did indeed. But that's not a way to introduce introduce yourself. Do you, tell, tell us what you do. <laughs> um, well, my name is Helly Paulesto. Very pleased to be here. Um, I work as a senior lecturer at the University of Eastern Finland. Uh, a lecturer of, of English, I, I may add. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, and you're you're uh, over Zoom with us today uh, from Finland. And we're going to be covering uh, subjects that interplay with each other from social justice, nature, philosophy, the human condition, climate, and even sustainability. These subjects interplay with each other. And um, what we will be guaranteed is no scripts, but real opinions. And uh, we hope by breaking down these big issues, uh, it will make you feel a, more of a custodian of the countryside and the nature and the environment around you. So, William. Um, if anybody um, wants to watch this conversation, how can they do that? They don't can't just they don't just listen to this when we're filming it. Yeah, we're going to be pl posting po the first half of this um, publicly, most likely on YouTube, uh, on Patreon as well publicly. Um, but there's going also going to be a part of this is going to be behind the, the Patreon paywall mm. as well. Um, mm. So yeah, it's going to be on those platforms, potentially even on Facebook. Um, just yeah. just keep an eye out for it. Yeah, so this is you're watching it right now. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you watch out for the tents sometimes, don't you? The past or the future. Exactly. But you know, you can listen to this or you can watch it. It's up to you. It depends what rattles your cage. Anyway, when we were planning this, Helly, um, we were talking about right to roam in wilderness, and you asked William and I a fantastic question about what is the UK perception of wilderness. And my, and my interpretation was, well, we don't really have wilderness in this country. Wilderness to us it, it is sort of uh, the North York Moors or Cornwall, where, where it can't be industrialised. And the only people who, who are out there are tourists or what we consider um, rather eccentric farmers. So we don't really have, I don't think, uh, a concept of wilderness is that right William is am I just spouting it off there yeah well I haven't, I haven't experienced both countries quite a lot I mean sometimes often I'm driving about a thousand miles around Finland uh, in the summertime and uh, you know you just I'm just always struck by just how much space there is between houses how much because once you get outside of Helsinki Mm. Um, there is life, but it's just very it's just very sparsely spread out compared to the UK. Whereas here, it's all it feels very. Um, you can't really find. You have to go quite a long, a reasonable distance to actually get to what I would class as wilderness. You talked about the North York Moors, for example, or Dartmoor, for example, mm. 
or the the center of wales or or even mm. even snowdonia doesn't even even, that, even snowdonia doesn't necessarily feel like wilderness it feels still mm. like it's very much very tamed whereas in finland it feels like you really are in often in the middle of nowhere especially as you know heli in in sort of north karelia you get to parts of north karelia it's it's you don't see anybody you don't hear any, you don't you can't mm. hear anything apart from the wildlife around you it's quite but, but i've Obviously, Heli, you can't give every Finnish perspective on wilderness. But what is your your uh, your your perspective on on wilderness, having lived lived in Finland? Then, what's the what's your perspective on wilderness? I think Finnish wilderness primarily exists in the north of the country. So even in in uh, areas like North Karelia, where it is fairly sparsely populated but I mean the forests are maintained somebody's looking after them and they are logged regularly so the mm. real wilderness to me is 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 kind of an area where people don't really interfere with the nature mm. what does that feel like to experience that because in the UK everything in the countryside is man-made it, it mm. exists and it looks like that because of man's impact well what's it like to turn the corner in Finland and come across something that doesn't feel man-made. It's fantastic. That's why people go mm. into the forests to experience that. Mm. I mean, here, here um, the, the, the problem we have in the UK is the person or people or entity that owns the landscape actually has too much control over that landscape. Um, and I'm not sure there's really that much natural about anything in the UK, William, because uh, 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 mm. it's mainly man-made. And we, I often hear people say we're overstimulated and stressed in man-made urban landscapes. But if you're a Brit and you go out into the rural landscape in the UK, that's man-made. That stresses me out at times. Mm. I was, I was going to say that... Um, <clears throat> With my experience of walking and going and doing any sort of walking around the UK, your first consideration is always, is this a public right of way? Is it a public footpath? Whether or not it's a public footpath that you can, it's just public land or it's public footpath that you've been allowed to walk down. That's the first consideration. I, I think that's the first consideration on most people's minds. So mm. you then just maybe feel a little bit sort of hemmed in. You have to sort mm. of, you can only go, walk in certain parts. You can't think about other ways i have actually thought about um planned very vaguely walking to my sisters uh, who lives she lives down near southampton which would be about probably about an 80 mile walk i think but i do wonder how i'd be able to do that because actually to, you couldn't just go and i don't feel i can just walk across a farmer's field for example mm. without 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 getting in serious trouble from the farmer we prefer farmer. not to do that in finland either i mean it's basically the right to roam concerns the forests Mm. yes but even 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 woods and forest is is the same thing because it would be yeah. Yeah. is it owned by somebody that's our first yeah. consideration how does that how so of course farmland is not something you will want to walk across because you don't want to trample on the you don't want to frighten the livestock you don't want to trample on the uh, the, the the crops they're growing but can mm. you do you feel Heli, that you can just walk into a, any woods or forest or is it oh absolutely uh, and mm. i mean everything feels the same way it's mm. something that we just we're brought up with the forests are ours in the sense that mm. anybody can go in there uh, picking berries and, and mushrooms and so forth they can even sell the berries if they want so yeah, it's completely free we, we don't have that even in woods you're always slightly looking over your shoulder not for a big grizzly bear but for a, the landowner with a rifle you know mm. i've told you that told you that story many times william where yeah you know where that yeah. bloke come out of the woods with a rifle but there you go it's a different different story yeah but, um it had a happy it, ending didn't it sure but yeah well, it did it did but that, that was my charm and charisma that got me through that I, I, but I, um i would say as well i mean uh, you're right heli actually all the all the all the woods around uh especially where uh, min is from ran in polviardi uh you can definitely tell they're managed forests mm. definitely and it almost feels like they're, they're almost like farms themselves, aren't they? They're yes, like a wood then, farm, yeah. Right? We talk about wood fields sometimes, like mm. yeah, because it makes forest sense, fields. But yeah, it still it still feels like even mm. in those managed forests, I'll be walking around, and it feels like there could be something in the woods. There's just some behind mm. that tree there, but whatever it is. I mean, we saw a lynx uh, down down in Ter- um, which is really cool. So you can kind of feel that that's going to be there, and mm. I've heard stories of bears being there, whereas 
that feels like more like wilderness. Even though it's managed wilderness, it still feels like wilderness compared to the UK, where, like I said, you'd have to go considerable distance before you actually... Like if, I, if, I, if I walked straight south from Oxford, I wouldn't really hit anything I would class as wilderness. I'd just, it'd just be rural landscape. I mean, the, mm. the British and English landscape especially is very, very beautiful. Rolling hills and it's very green and very lush. But at the same time, it feels feels very managed you don't have this in any any sort of no. wild places i no. think you really have to get to the wild of scotland you know to the highlands mm. before you actually feel like you're you're going to get lost properly but in, in the uk we talk a lot about rewilding um but i was thinking last night of preparing for this i was actually thinking that we should actually be thinking about more genuine wilderness rewilding like you're talking about william because everything looks man-made and which is for the benefit of all everybody and all the ecosystems and not seeing ourselves as separate to nature but what i would like to see in that conversation is not just about rewilding the landscapes but rewilding ourselves so we're part of it as well heli in the in finland do you have this concept of rewilding no never yeah. heard it before but on yeah. the other hand we i think we are a little bit wilder in general mm. than you guys yeah urbanization is such a recent thing in finland basically finland only became like seriously urbanized after the second world war so we have even people who live in the cities whose parents have been living in the cities they tend to have their roots in the countryside at least to some extent in their families so in other words we kind of all have a connection mm. to the countryside and to the forests in that mm. sense yeah, i was gonna i was just thinking that um Stuart and I have talked about in the past about how well, we've been asked directly the question, how did we get into nature, which is a bit of a strange question because both of us have just lived in nature from a very young age. But what's your what's your what's one of your earliest memories, Heli, of, of nature? <clears throat> um, well, my grandparents were farmers. So <laughs> that's it, basically. Um, just being in the farm, right? Just being in the farm. Uh, Picking blueberries, swimming in the lakes, you know, it's just a part of your life. Mm. It, it feels very, it sounds very idyllic. I mean, I've, I've swam in quite a few lakes in Finland and it's just, it just feels like, that feels like real wild swimming, mm. real, being right, really, in, if, if it really, yeah, out there, really wild mm. <laughs> compared to what I you mean, get here. Like, see, there's that, I still, we'll always compare that, you know, it's like, this feels, can sometimes feel really artificial in the UK. Whereas in Finland, oh, I'm sorry. It just feels like you go when I go to Finland, it feels like I, I, I really am in the wilderness. Even when I'm in a managed forest, it feels like I'm in, in the wild. Mm -hmm. mm. And Finns love their summer cottages. I mean, yeah. we have thousands and thousands of them, um, basically. Mm. Yeah. I was watching a, a program. Uh, I didn't expect to hear this quote from this program, but it was a Brian Cox, the scientist, he was talking about astronomy. Uh, and somehow I, I drifted away, stopped concentrating, and I came back when I heard this. But there, there was a quote on this uh, program saying that the West Sea land and resources is something they own, but indigenous cultures don't have the same focus on ownership. Do, do you see, Heli, um, the, the, this obsession with ownership? non-existent in Finland or is it getting worse or is it just a stable thing that never really changes? Um, there is ownership. I mean, mm. forests are usually privately owned. Some are state owned. Um, and then there are like national parks and nature reserves and those kind of places mm. nationally owned as well. But I mean, um, the question of ownership doesn't really come into the right to roam because mm. it's we we have this right yeah it doesn't depend on whether somebody owns the land or not so that's very it's, interesting. it's kind of a separate question that's yeah, very you... interesting to us because it's exactly the same thing in the uk you know yeah. which, you... which we want to explore do you know how long that right, right to roam has been there is it just always been, always been since i i mean um i was just because i'm not an expert on this issue mm. i was just reading quite recently that it was only towards the end of the 19th century that it was actually trespassing was made a criminal offense in Finnish mm. law and that only applied to very few like occasions when you were actually harming the environment or harming somebody's property mm. so beyond that um, it's always been like perfectly 
legal and perfectly okay to wonder about. Very different. So, so if a fin, if fin, if the fins were suddenly blocked from having access, what would happen? <laughs> you mean if this right to roam was taken from us? Yeah. yeah. I don't think it would be received very well. I mean, mm. people would definitely riot. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I just got that. I'm just getting this sort of my mind's eye of fins rioting because yeah, you know, on the whole, they'd be is... okay. They'd be writing into the newspapers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, fins are very and in Twitter. On on, I mean, this is this is going to be stereotype act completely, and I've, I know so many fins that are completely uh, different different ends of spectrum of character mm. and everything. But um, and on the whole, fin your fins your fins are quite quite calm and measured and yeah, that type That's of thing. That's the general idea. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. Not no small small talk is. It took me a while to to sort of like be happy with silence because in British culture, especially silence is like almost the worst, almost like a faux pas. It's almost like you, know, you can't have a room where it's quiet. You've got to have something happening. So somebody will mention the weather. That's the reason why people, we, we're, fi we're fixated upon the weather here because it's like, we have to talk, be talk about something. Mm. <laughs> but the, you're interesting, you, you say uh, it's always been like that, the right to roam, because I, I've been doing a lot of reading around this about in the UK. And, and our, our restrictions go back over a thousand years um, mm. to when land started to be, be owned. I think it goes back to William the Conqueror. The yeah, that's what I was, I was reading about that too. Yeah. Um, but then in, from the 1600s through to about the 1900s, there was this Government Enclosure Act that actually started to sell off little tracts of land uh, and it actually removed a lot of common land from the general population. Mm. So we, we ceased to have the ability to graze our animals anywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'd just like to throw this in there, especially in a UK perspective. Should anybody own acres and acres of land just because an ancestor 100 years ago came into possession of it? potentially through colonialism and the slave trade. Should anybody ethically be allowed to own acres and acres and acres of land? So we're, you're talking about um, inheritance, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, how do you get past inheritance? Because inheritance is, if somebody leaves that in their will, then that's mm. somebody's inheritance. How do you stop that? Mm. How can you legislate? Again, would that, I think that would lead to riots if you did that. Mm. Mm. I don't think you can stop that. But is, so, is it down to the fact what you do with your inheritance? You might be it might be ethical to own all this land, but to 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 exclude yeah. us. Yeah, so, I mean, actually, I was just thinking in Oxford. There's at least one place I can think of that was was donated by by a family. In, you know, uh, there's the uh, Burying Old Library in Headington. Mm. There was there was yep. a house. So it, it, here in Oxford, we have a place called Burying Old Park in Headington, and the park was the grounds for this house and the house was actually left to the city and this, mm. then it became that house then became Headington library so it's a really mm. beautiful building in these beautiful grounds that is now a an open public park so mm. there are there are people that do that there are people that do mm. that do have that that ethos well, well what's your outside perspective on on, on families in in the UK uh, uh, Heli uh, owning acres and acres of land historically and then excluding anybody that moves from walking on it um it sucks <laughs> but yeah. i guess they have the right to do that on the other hand um if it doesn't produce any harm to the environment if you have like um within those acres and acres you have forests for instance then where's mm. the harm in you know letting people in there i don't yeah. know very good point. Yeah. But, um, go on. Yeah, I was go on. I, I, through that throughout this whole conversation. I've been thinking about uh, there is a definite is a definite drive here in this country to be owning property in general. That's the that's 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 a measure of that's a massive measure of success in the UK that you own your own house. Mm. That renting your house or or or, dare, or even worse, actually having a house that's <coughs> maybe council property. You know, this uh, social housing, as it's been called so many times, or council housing, is almost seen as being um, a failure. I think I think something Margaret Thatcher had something, something said. If somebody 
a person, a person or a man in their thirties, if, if they're still, if they're still on the bus, they failed somewhere in life. <laughs> mm. it, it seems to be this aspiration. Maybe I think, I think, I think quite often that the UK looks um, towards more towards the US than it does Europe as far mm. as uh, culture is concerned. And I think that's part of it, but I understand in Finland, it's just much easier. And I think it might be the same in Germany, but in Finland, it's just much easier to, to go and rent a, rent a property and it's not, could be owned by the, the state or owned by the council or yeah i mean it's considered a personal decision in some cases i mean in some cases obviously if you can't afford to buy your own house or, or your own flat then what can you do but rent mm. but on the other hand if, if um you prefer to rent then that's that's it perfectly but it, okay and but it's, it's considered it, your own it decision seems, it seems like a that's such a different way of looking at things and, and mm. i think that's what leads to this whole idea of the right to roam you know i this is my piece of land i get to say who goes who walks across this land i get to say who's mm. here you know no matter how big or small that is it's i i had an interesting uh situation in a, a hospital waiting room a couple of years ago i can't remember who it was i think it was a fellow patient who was waiting and they were saying where did i live and i said and they said oh do you own it i said uh, no it's a council property and they said oh i'm so sorry <laughs> I thought, oh, that's fine. You don't need to apologise. I'm quite happy. But it's interesting, William, as you say. Yeah, so that, I, th I think, but I think that's the root of this whole thing. Mm. So in Finland, you've got this sort of right to roam that goes back hundreds of years, whereas it seems to be in the UK, everything's been sort of slowly, slowly, surely, surely mm. closed down. The Enclosure Act yeah. is probably one of the big things that yeah. started that, definitely. But I, 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 I am... Um... I was also reading the other day that the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, uh, are now really beginning to uh, realise and encourage us to access wild places for our well-being and our health. And the Treasury Department within the government recognises the financial cost of having sedentary lives. And so we need access to natural places, not, exclu not exclusion. We're not all vandals that are going out there destroying the countryside. And it's, it, this is all about equity of access, I think. Mm. And it just seems um, that from the outside perspective, the, the general view in Finland is you do have equity of access and, mm. and you would riot if you didn't have it. And then because we're having it taken away from us and we are rioting in a peaceful way, uh, we're being uh, criminalised for it. It's just... Uh, Equity of access. What's the what's your view on that, um, Ellie? Um, I think it's really important because um, I think like if if you only have access to property and and uh, spaces that you own, it definitely creates a lot of inequity in society. Mm. And in Finland as well, one of the reasons for the right to roam is is that the health benefits of mm. walking outside in nature are definitely recognized, both mentally and physically. Mm. William? There are also financial advantages in the sense that it makes sense that the berries that are growing out there in the woods are picked. Somebody um, can kind of go and, and get them and, and either eat them themselves or on, then sell and mm. create further revenue and 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 just just thinking about it as well there's one maybe one concept telly that you are maybe not even familiar with but mm. in the, it, because we have so very few wild places in the uk we have these things called nature reserves mm. so we had with quite an interesting discussion a couple of years ago with a guy called andy gunn who works for uh one of the national uh, one of the wildlife trusts the very local wildlife trust here in oxfordshire and uh, he, he brought this question about you know should well, should or should do you, do you understand what a, the concept of a of a of a, 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 a wildlife sanctuary is or a wildlife area? Mm -hmm. Nature reserve. A nature yeah. reserve, yeah, yeah. Do you do you actually have them in? Yes. Oh, yeah. In Finland. So I wonder if they are the same as here because often, and this is what Stuart has said many times, and I totally agree with him that often with uh, nature nature sanctuaries here. What are they calling them now? Nature. Yeah. Nature reserve. Nature Let's reserve. Call them nature, reserve. Na nature reserves here are, are just bits of land that can't be used for any other purpose and they're just allowed to allowed to go wild basically yeah That's yeah what, what, what happens but 
so what would a nature reserve be in Finland? Because that'd be that's that's an interesting thing maybe to to to, to discover. Uh, well, so, national uh, parks, for instance, are really popular um, targets for people to go um, walking in and mm -hmm. hiking. But on the other hand, they have their special rules of conduct. Then I mean, you can't go about like wandering about the same way mm. as you would elsewhere, and you usually have to stay on on the tracks. Mm. Um, you have to camp in specific campsites, um, and they're actually, yeah, a bit more restricted in that sense than yeah, I mean, the rest. We have that, we have that here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's national parks, whereas we have these we have these nature reserves, which are small enclaves that are in built sort of built up areas that are have mm. been earmarked as a nature reserve, but mm. it's almost like we discussed again with Andy that it was. Are we just allowing someone to? We're just allowing someone to be there, and then we're yeah, well, what, also managing that as well. It's almost like yeah. there's a bit of human control over over that nature as well. What, what it is is um, we have these little plots of land in these urban settings that um, the, the, no, nobody particularly wants at this point in time. So a, a nice little wooden sign is put up on the gate saying "local nature reserve." It just looks better than saying this is a derelict piece of land that nobody wants. Uh, and it actually is almost useless to, to a lot of nature because it's disconnected from where all the na other nature is. Mm. Yeah, we've talked about green corridors in the past. Yeah, and, and I would say, I would think that probably because, again, the difference between the UK and Finland is that we are just so much more squashed in here. Yeah. You know, we have so much arable land around here in Oxford. Uh, in fact, it, I've been, and you've, because you fly quite a bit normally, um, mm. flying over the UK flying over the north north of Europe as well, so over the Netherlands, over Denmark. Um, it's, it's so much different than when you're flying over Sweden and Finland. The, the landscape is so different. Mm. It just feels like there's just so much more life, uh, whereas here it seems like it's just a patchwork mm. of fields, really. Mm. But the, uh, we, we were talking, William, about um, I was raising a few points on, on, on this subject, and you, and you said to me, well, a lot of people might not even be aware of the problem, this mm. problem, and might not even care uh, anyway and 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 uh, 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 linked to that i just like to raise that floating down a river can still be considered trespass in the uk because somebody actually owns that water surface as well uh, and um i think we should really be fighting for access to our rivers and not be excluded via these new trespass laws that are actually coming in um, and we're even being excluded from rivers, as, even if we got access to them through pollution, because raw sewage is actively being pumped into, into it by our water companies, who we are paying to process it properly. And I'd just like to see a few of these corporate leaders and these water companies, a bit of corporate accountability, and see some of those leaders of those water companies that are pumping that stuff into the, into the water, being put in prison, because I think that might fo focus the mind on the polluters. And if we can sort the pollution out, we actually open up bits of land that we do have access to that is actually too toxic to go to. Yeah, I, I do wonder, I do wonder how many people here in the UK really care about it. Maybe mm. they just haven't been, maybe, maybe there's just too, too many people that are, I'm, I'm, I'm being pessimistic maybe, but there's too many people that just like to get in their car and drive to the supermarket, go home again. Mm. But you said earlier, Heli, uh, that, that the Finns are connected to their environment. Did, did, do you think you're, the Finns are generally more connected to their environment than other nations? Or, 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 is, or is it, um, was that just a flippant comment? Uh, in a way, it was. I yeah. mean, it, it, in, it's a kind of a myth that we yeah. like to maintain ourselves, that we have this special relationship with nature, but mm. not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, mm. there's quite a lot of um, exploitation going on in Finland as mm. well. So it's not like we're treating mm. our environment any more kindly than any other nation, I don't think. Mm. We've said that before as well, William, that indigenous cultures, we assume, are more connected to their environment. But it's just the situation they find themselves in and also the outside perception of what we view. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. But mm. I, 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 do, I do still, I still feel, may, may, I, my, 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 my interpretation or my, my 
um, experience of being a villain has been, you know, North Karelia and and being in around in the round farm. So it does always feel very rural. It always feels very. Um, so Min's cousin is always going out on the boat fishing. That's what he does. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, mm. it just feels quite feels mm. just very relaxed quite often. You know, that's what it is. But then I'm on holiday as well. So, so yeah, exactly. So many, so many factors, right? Mm. It depends it's, how it's, you're it's, viewing it from on that day as well. What you're bringing to it. Yeah, what I'm bringing, what I'm bringing to the country, because I really mm. have missed going to going there. I really missed going there because it's been nearly two years since I've been in Finland. Um, but it's something you live to, day to day, Heli, right? It's it's mm. where you live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think again, like there are maybe two different issues, the two ways in which we look at our environment. I mean, on the one hand, it, it's something that we need to uh, look after something that we need to care for because it um, benefits us um, so does the nature actually have value in itself or is it just valuable because we can benefit from it mm. um, so this yeah. is the kind of debate that is politically quite charged in Finland mm. yeah I like, okay I like that, I like, that. I like, yeah. I like does, does, does nature have value in itself and not just yeah. it's not just valuable to us yeah, that, that, that's what I was saying about these local nature reserves. They're there because that land doesn't have any value to anybody at that point in time. But they're quite happy to destroy it and build on it at a later date if it does become valuable and then overlook the nature. Yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of, I kind of think it shows just as a human humanity as a whole um, how we think about things by what what species we protect and what species we we kill. Right? Mm. It, it definitely shows. You know, we 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 don't want to protect a shark, but we we wanted to protect the we wanted to protect the um the pandas, right? I thought you were going to say the pope for a minute. <laughs> I thought, well, I thought you were going to say. I'm sure that some people in the world want to protect the pope. Yeah. Well, I think okay. nature reserves in Finland are a bit different in the sense that there's actually something that is like unique and special mm. about those places, and that's why they have been made into nature reserves or yeah. national parks, which yeah. also include national reserves. So they're kind of one and the same thing. Okay, before we uh, finish the first part of this conversation, this is public, and then go behind uh, the paywall on Patreon, uh, something I would like to raise, uh, when we had the idea, uh, where the idea for this conversation came from, William, is we, we, we had a, somebody ask us a question about um, reclaiming our land through trespass, mass trespass. Mm -hmm. And I, I raised the fact that uh, in 1932, there was a mass trespass on Kinder Scout, a mountain in Northern England. Um, uh, uh, and um, you asked me more about that. And, I, uh, and basically that mass trespass is because we, we were really, really excluded from land. And this trespass happened by a load of locals and it was condemned by the government, and the police, landowners, and even the nucleus of the walking associations, the rambling associations. But that trespass led to the government um, countryside and right to roam act. Uh, and also it, it, it directly led to the establishment of national parks in the 1940s. I think the Peak District was the first national park. Um, but I've been reading a lot around this lately. And uh, again, we, you and I, William, had a conversation and we, we, we questioned some of this. And I've been reading a lot about the Right to Rome campaign. There's a nice little book out there at the moment. At the bottom of my pile here, I'm not going to get it now. But it's called the right, uh, the book of trespass by Nick Hayes, um, and also George Mumbio in the in the Guardian are writing about this. And, th and this figure keeps being thrown out there, and I'd like to challenge it. That um, we are still only allowed access to eight percent of the English land, and a, and a mere three percent of the UK waterways. And that highlights how much open space is, is not accessible to the vast majority of the public. But you and I had this conversation. Does that 8% include public highways? And does it include like private gardens? Now, on the assumption that 8% of land we got access to includes highways and gardens, there's very little out there that mm. you know, we have access to. Now, if it doesn't include highways and private gardens, 8% still isn't a lot. Yeah, I do wonder if that's 8% of 
basically land that you are able just to walk on without any permission granted or needed. Because mm. um, there's a lot, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a railway, there's a bridge that goes, a footbridge that goes over the railway near Oxford that has blatantly has a sign on it saying this is owned by Network Rail, it's not a public right of way, but it is mm. a public right of way at the same time to give permission to it, but it's actually mm -hmm. owned by somebody else. So often you'll be on land that you, you, you just walk mm. through, you'll go, you'll go through a certain part mm. of a city or whatever, um, and not realise it's not actually, um, it's not, it's, it's private land. I mean, mm. a lot of land in Oxford is private land, isn't it? Of course, it's yeah. a lot of the colleges and universities. Um, mm. So I think that 8% might be just that it's, I think 8% is a very, very small figure because it just, mm. if, surely if it's 8%, then we wouldn't be moving anywhere, would we? Mm. <laughs> ah. sounds, but and also, by the way, the, 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 you, you, Stuart mentioned, you mentioned the episode, didn't you, that we, we yeah. were referring back to. It was released on the 8th of, 8th of June. It was a question from Cliff in Radley, which is a village yeah. here in Oxfordshire. Yeah, I mean, we're, this 8% does focus the mind, but Willem and I always say, be careful how you interpret data. Mm. Question it, dig down into it. Clearly... Yeah there's a lot of exclusion going on and clearly the top one percent in uk society uh, own the vast amount of land but it's just um it just opens the thinking eight percent it may not be accurate but it's not going to suddenly shoot up to 90 percent is actually available it's a low figure and my point is for a tangible effect on the nation's health that the government and the and the National Health Service want, we must be allowed access to nature on a more regular basis and open spaces nearer to our homes because there are some people who don't, don't have other access. So we need this right to roam on our doorsteps. And there are a lot of mass trespasses being organised. Again, um, it's gone full circle. Uh, and the, these mass trespasses, they're not vandals. They're just going on walks, they're singing songs, they're reading poetry, it's peaceful, um, but they're met with violence from the landowners, the police and the bailiffs. There, there, there's a lot of them and us going on. Yeah, I, I wonder what the perception will be of those, those protests from, from the general public, because we've mm. seen how, how people um, uh, in general react to any sort of, sort of protest like that. Um, yeah. Again, I can't see that as sort of being the case in Finland. You know, it's just... It just feels like a different, a very different, very different environment than here in the UK. I think. Mm. Well, Helly, would the Finns you know, to, to protest about exclusion? Would you be going out there reading poetry and singing songs in the countryside, or would you be rioting? Hard to say. Um, poetry would be a fairly um, limited hobby, I yeah. think. Yeah. That, that was a that was a real curveball there from Stuart. That's a question. Yes, <laughs> okay. tough one. Can can you speak for the whole, whole of Finland whether whether or not they go out reading read poetry in nature? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and on that bombshell, we're going to finish this first part. And uh, William, if somebody wants to watch the second part behind the paywall of this conversation, where we'll just continue digging into this, how can they find page us on Patreon, William? Uh, it's just go to the go to patreon.com and. Uh, forward slash the people's countryside and uh, there are variant tiers of patronity or patronizing as we like to call it sometimes <laughs> um yeah and for those different tiers of uh, back support um you have you'll get varying access to many many different things like uh behind the scenes material um q a sessions exclusive q a sessions for myself and Stuart, where you're mm. able to talk to us about the podcast and many other things um, yeah, just go and check it out. Mm. People's Countryside. Oh, sorry, patreon.com uh, forward slash the people's countryside.